Mighty Ma. What's the other part? Catch a tiger by his toe. If he hollers, let him go. Any, many, mighty, mo. And the long version was, my mama told me to choose the very best one, and that is Y-O-U. First of all, it don't make any sense. Don't catch a tiger by its toe. And if he's hollers, you're probably going to be dead. And so those methods of choosing were methods that were brought out to us when we were growing up. In other words, we didn't get a lot of coaching on how to make decisions, yet we have been given the greatest responsibility in reality, and that is to manage our own free will and to reflect God's truth in what we're doing. So here's our focus for today. Our focus is the greatest repeated failure of God's people in our, is our willing, unwillingness or inability to manage the responsibility of free will choices. Right. Amen. Now, if you want to see where we fail as God's people, and not just our generation of God's people, but I'm talking about going all the way back. To Moses Nim, Abraham Nim, Job Nim, Jonah Nim, all them Nims made the same mistake that we're making on a regular basis, and that is we are not effectively managing our free will choice, which is one of the early unique things that God gave us in, in, as his unique and precious most prized creation. I give you free will choice. And everybody doesn't have free will choice. Every being doesn't have free will choice, I should say. But every human being does. Now, here's the deal. It is the most significant skill that we can have in the game of humanity. The most significant skill is the ability to effectively manage our free will choices. You know, Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal, unquestionably one of the best basketball players that we've seen in our time. However, there is one part of the game that shows up in every single game and determines how effective you are in pulling off a win. And that is shooting free throws. Problem with Shaq is he was great to the game, loyal to the coach, committed to his team. He was all those other kinds of things, but he couldn't do the main thing. So many times they had to take him out of the game because the expectation to shoot free throws made him a losing contribution to a good team. Many of us, God has to take out of the game because we haven't learned how to be effective in the primary thing that we have to do to win as human beings, to be who God wants us to be. So what we've done is we've been having a conversation about this constitution. And, and we've highlighted and focused on the five constitutional principles. These are the five answers that you need to answer as an individual, if you're married, as a, a couple, if you have children as a family. One of them is, what's your final authority? The other one is, what's your source of growth? Next one is, how do you view humanity? The one we're on today is, what are your primary principles to live by? Principles to live by. So we're talking about principles to live by. The last, next one's going to be a system of accountability, and we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about that not only as individuals, but as a church, are we discipling people toward their constitutional living? And so, principle to live by. Let me give you a definition that we can kind of work with. It is key principles that drive your application of truth, your general behavior, and a standard for your emotional management. 
i.e. or in short, how will we manage our free will choices? How will we manage our free will choices? You know, if you were on the, um, uh, if you were on the uh, football team and you had no playbook, then everybody would just run around and do what they feel like doing. And you would be chaotic as a team. In fact, sometimes we've seen our team, and, and I, my question is, what did they say in the huddle? Because whatever that, that, whatever that was, I'm sure that wasn't the discussion. And that's what the world says about the church. What are they saying when they get together? Because I'm looking at their lives, and they apparently don't have a playbook. The playbook guides your choices on the field. And so if you have that in place, if you don't have that in place, then the other three things that we talked about primarily in your constitution will not be applied to everyday life. So that has to be there. Now, let me give you an example, and I must confess, these examples are examples that we use in our that we've used in our family as our constitution. And what I'll do is I'll uh, you know I'll show you our whole constitution uh, at some point, like when we get to the next sermon or so. I'll just bring it in, so you can see kind of what it looks like, big frame constitution, and you'll see kind of what our kids have had to endure <laughs> all their lives growing up. Uh, but what it's done is it's given them a framework for living. So, principle to live by, here's an example. Our family, in our family, we live by faith in God to understand truth over our experiences, influence, or cultural history. We acknowledge God in all things rather than lean to our own understanding. And we seek first God's kingdom agenda and see that, uh, and see that as a means to achieving all things in life. So seeking God's kingdom is how we get that. So if you say, well, I want to get married, you seek God's kingdom in order to lead to marriage. You seek God's kingdom in order to understand how to parent. You seek God's kingdom. So, so really you have this framework that helps us be able to evaluate and coach ourselves as those who have been called to live under this constitution. Now, so before we dive into the principal applications, I want you to understand kind of the biblical framework around what things changed at the time in the garden, because you want to know what, what went wrong in the garden. Now, we've been talking about, the reason why we've been reading the whole thing is because we've been talking about what went wrong in the garden, but now the reason why we started at verse number 19 is because we're really talking about what changed as a result of what went wrong. So here's the first thing. The first thing is chronology started. Chronology started. In other words, there was no time ticking prior to that. So if you can imagine, nothing was getting old. Amen. People be looking for the answers to the fountain of youth. It's in the garden. We got kicked out. So you ain't going to never find the, the fountain of youth in this, in this world, the fountain of youth. And here's the deal. There was no need for a fountain of youth when people weren't aging. But if you have the right answer, why mess with it? So it wasn't necessary for anything to produce after its own kind, even though God, in his redemptive nature, created everything so it could. Now, let me tell you why that's important. The angels could not produce after their own kind. So when they failed, there was no redemptive measure. When they failed, the only now option is eternal damnation. When God created us, he created us with the ability to fall and not be eternally damned. So therefore, he created us with a redemptive nature, but a part of that redemptive nature was to be able to duplicate or to replicate ourselves. So the reason why you have a little you running around is because God knew that if we messed up, chronology would begin to take place and we would start depreciating. We have a depreciating value as humanity. We get... We deteriorate, okay? So if you say, Lord, help me not get old, then he's just going to have to take you out of here early because that's the only solution. The only solution to not getting old is dying. 
Here's what he says to them in Genesis 3, verse number 19. He says, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. So he's saying, so, so now you're going to start dying. But since the ground is cursed, it's not going to give you food anymore. The sweat of your brow, you're going to have to earn it now. And when you earn it, you're going to have to earn it for the rest of your life until you die. In other words, what he's saying is dying, you will surely die. Over a period of time, you're going to get to that point where you're going to die. Because deterioration started. So how was Adam and Eve in the garden? We don't know because age wasn't happening. All we know is they were created as adults and then start dying after sin. He says, since you were taken from the ground, excuse me, since from it you were taken, for dust, uh, for dust you are and dust you will return. Now, here's the interesting thing. They were not created from the dust or the dirt in the garden. Adam was created from the dirt out of the garden. So God took him out of a wilderness and brought him into a garden. But he decided that he wanted to go back into the wilderness. Don't blame him because he's just like us. God takes us out of our wilderness. I don't know what your wilderness is. Some of you smoke your wilderness. Some of you drink your wilderness. Some of you cussed out people with your wilderness. I mean, you do all this stuff with your wilderness. It might be an attitude. It might be a, a whatever the case of the matter is. But God's trying to get you out of your wilderness so you can experience a little garden. But some of us love our wilderness so much. Hey, man, I better leave that alone. So then he says, since we are becoming replicative, Adam then named Eve, named his wife Eve. She used to be woman. So he changed the name to Eve. Why? Because she would become, because she is the one who's going to be replicating humanity. She's going to have that physical experience. So the shift is beginning to take place there. All right. Here's the second thing. God disciples them through the new redemptive process. Because nothing was dying. They had no redemptive need. But now they have a redemptive need. In other words, somebody got to pay God for when we mess up. So God put a process in place, he, and, and here's what Genesis chapter 19, uh, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 21 says this. It says, uh, the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and clothed them. Garments of skin from what? The sacrificial animal. Some animal had to die. First death. So some animal was sacrificed so that he could cover them. The symbolic element. Now, that didn't stop in, the, in there, but it also continued on. Adam, uh, if you go through Abraham and all of them, the sacrificial laws that he put in place was how to effectively do what God did here. All right? Here's number three. Number three, they lost their, lost, this should be lost, they lost their protection over free will choice. Their protection over free will choices. He said, what's that? Here's what God said to them. Verse 22. And the Lord said to them, excuse me, and the Lord said, not to them in general, this is just a general statement that God is making, a statement of reality. The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. In other words, he's now responsible for his own choices. So rather than up for us to take care of his free will, he chose to do it on his own. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat it and live forever. Now, why is that a big deal for God? Because the redemptive characteristic of God is the purpose of the creation of man. So that we can see, so that angels can see, so that existence can see God's redemptive character. But if we eat from the tree while we are in our sin then that means that we suffer the same damnation as the angels and nobody would be able to see the redemptive element. 
So God moves them out of the way. It's always interesting, you know. Some, I was watching, uh, we was watching a movie, me and, me and my wife, and they, they, uh, and in the movie, the people told them, "Look, we understand your destination and where you're going and all this kind of stuff, but stay on the path. Don't get off the path. The path has created a clear uh, 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 way for you to get to your destination. The path is safe." And the path keeps you from having to make a lot of decisions that you will have to make off the path. And what they do? Got off the path. Now you're in the woods and ain't nobody guiding you and you got to figure out what to do. Adam moved from a garden to this. This ain't feeding you. The animals up there, they ain't friendly with you. He said, well, if you see a mountain lion, raise your hand and bark like a dog. I probably will run, especially if I'm by myself. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be looking through strategy because I'm not good at making decisions in that moment. I would prefer that you guide me along the path that's going to keep me from running into the mountain lion. Amen. It's a shame that we are still doing this after all these years. Here's what verse number 23 says. So... Uh, so the Lord banished him from the garden, uh, from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. In other words, this is the ground you've been taking. You don't even have to bother that. I put you in a garden that would take care of you. But you prefer to go work it yourself. So I'll put you back out there where you came from. God ever did that to you? Don't raise your hand. He told you what to do. You acted up and he said, well, I'm just going to go on and put you among the people who you came from so they can tear you apart. Wow. And so he says, after he drove the man out. I don't know what that was like. I wouldn't want God driving me out. But if he drove the man out. That means that the man wasn't, he was like, God, really? I don't really want to go out there. I mean, he, was, he didn't want to go. God drove him out. Then he says, and he placed on the east side of the garden, uh, garden of Eden, cherubim and flaming swords and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. In other words, they were going to be going back. They were like, God, I know you told me to leave, but you ever kick your kids out? And then I told you to leave. They keep coming back. Why? Because that's their only place of safety. Once, and, and here's the deal. There's always a point in the kid's life where they think, I can do this on my own. The parents are like, look, I put you in a situation where you don't have to pay bills. You don't have to worry about bills. You don't have to make decisions about money. You don't have to make decisions about where the food's coming from. You don't have to make decisions about where your lights, your gas. You know, I, I put you in a place where you don't have to make none of those decisions. All you got to do is obey me. We get to a point where we say, look, I don't want to obey you no more. I will make my own decisions. And then when we get out there, we're like, you ain't changed my room yet, have you? Because those decisions ain't fun. So what God says is, I'm going to hide the garden. So, so you won't come running back up in here talking about you changed your mind. So here's the deal. Dealing with the new responsibility of free will choice. So he gives us a responsibility of free will choice. And let me share this. You know, I shared this before. We talked about the curse, the difference between a curse and a consequence. Okay? A curse is, a, is, is invoked. Uh, it is a, a, a supernatural, invoked by a future, future, supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something. That means that I can't get out of it. It's not a thing that determines what I do. He did not curse Adam or Eve. He cursed the ground, cursed the animals of which the snake would suffer the worst. So when you get to make your own free will decisions, here's what happens. You, you suffer consequences. So when you make a bad decision or something bad's happened to you or the world gets bad and all this kind of stuff, then it's not that God's doing something bad to us. We are living the consequences of not making the best choice. Amen. If you get off the path, then that bear's going to be like, well, heck, he was here. Right. All the rest of the people's over there. He was here. So apparently he wanted to be chicken or fish. 
All right. So here's what God did. God gave us multiple choices. Let me show you the two choices that he gave us. Here they are. First of all, he says, you can surrender your free will over to me for protection. And I will expose only good choices to you. You will only see good choices. This is kind of what parents say to their kids. Listen, I will make good choices for you. And you don't have to worry about what you should eat. You don't have to worry about all those different kinds of things. I will take all those choices and make the best choices for you. Or I can expose you to all the choices and you will have to decide good and evil. We chose B. We chose B. Now, here's the thing about choosing B. I'm going to put the multiple choice in front of you. Here's kind of... Look at this for a second. Here's the multiple choice. So the multiple choice is, if seven is the right answer, seven is the right answer, but two is up there. I told you, look, seven is the right answer. You don't have to look. If, if you already know the right answer, you don't need a lot of choices. Matter of fact, if you already know the right answer, even if seven is the right answer and you say, okay, now I'm going to give you a whole bunch of choices, this is what it looks like then. Okay. Seven is still the right answer, but how much more confusing is it now? Y'all with me? So the answer hasn't changed. The number of choices have changed. And let me tell you something. This is the parents. And, and I'll talk about this in detail a little bit more, but one of the biggest mistakes we make is we give kids choices early when we know the right answer. Like, I know when we were growing up, and part of the reason is, is that, that the parents today have more choices than we had. Like, like I heard, I heard people be, kid be two years old. I don't like cereal. I, this is the way I want my, I want my toast to be this way. I want to, I'm like, what? When we grew up, there was, mama didn't have a lot of choices. If you don't like cereal, you're going to be hungry till lunch. Mama fed us based on food groups. Like if you wanted all meat, there wasn't no, he don't eat. You know, mama fed us stuff like liver sometimes. We had to eat our vegetables. We're like, well, he don't like green beans, so I just give him. No, no, you can't. You can't give the child choices that early and expect for them to learn how to make choices. Because here's what you've done, and we'll talk about this later. You have taught the child that their choices are based on their desire. And sometimes you have to eat the vegetables that you don't like. Because the choice is not based on how you feel. The choice is based on what you need. So now, when they're in school and they say, I don't want to go, you're confused. How are you going to tell me you don't want to go? Because you taught me that my desire determines what's right for me when I was a kid. Hey, man, let me move on. But when you start giving a lot of choices. Now, when we were growing up, and let me tell you something. Black folks were much more unified when we had fewer choices. I mean, when we didn't, when we didn't have no choice on where we're going to live, we loved each other, took care of our schools, cleaned up our neighborhood, we did all that kind of stuff. We weren't killing each other. Once you gave us choices, amen, and, and, and not because choices are bad, because we never mastered how to make effective choices. OK, and so uh, not only that, in addition to that, if you kind of look at uh, uh, if you look at school, uh, at least we got caught when we did. Uh, we had truancy officers. We had all those different kind of things going on. We loved our education. We cared about each other. And we criticized people who didn't didn't learn. Now that we have choices, we don't take care of our schools, we don't connect with each other, we don't study together, we don't even, we don't even parade and support those who advance. Y'all with me? Yeah. Choices has caused us 
major problems, not because of choices, it is because we don't have a biblical principle or biblical foundation to live by. So therefore, choices will get you in trouble. Because I can tell you, even if you saw all those numbers up there, but you were very committed to seven, it doesn't matter. You're still going to be on seven. All that other stuff is wasted noise. Amen. Amen. You remember when before we had social media? Yep. We had friends. Yep. People that we hung out with, people who we went to places with. We, we, people, when we went to events, we went in groups, wow. and we all knew each other. And we did all those different kinds of things together. We were much more uh, concerned about how relationships developed. Uh, we took care of each other's kids. We did all those different kinds of things. Now we have choices. This is going to make some of y'all mad. But when you didn't have choices, you took care of your hair. I told you this is going to make some of y'all mad. You washed your hair. You were concerned about the perms. You did all those different kinds of things. You did all that kind of stuff. But then once you had choices, you just braid it and put something on top of it. Once upon a time, we didn't have choices. We had to take care of our hair. We had to make our bozos where it's bald on the top and hair on the bottom. We had to straighten that up. We had to get all that stuff together. Once you get choices, you move away from responsibility. And you choose the least point of resistance. So let's talk about the greatest mistakes that we've made. What are our greatest mistakes regarding free will choices? Here's number one. First of all, we coach towards the outcome rather than the process. We don't teach people how to make good choices. We just talk about and criticize the choices that they make. So instead of saying, Shaq, let's go and talk about the process of shooting that free throw. We say, boy, you missed again? In fact, now that we're in council culture, we, you know, anytime anybody does anything that they could grow and improve on, we just want them out. Let's get them out. Matter of fact, we want everybody to be fired for every little thing based on Facebook and, uh, and the Internet and all that kind of stuff, except for us. Like, you've been late 16 times. How are you going to say that they should be fired and you still think you should have a job? You see what I'm saying? I mean, it just you go on and on and on, the, the, the ability. So when you're working with your kids, you ought to have a redemptive approach rather than a prosecutorial approach. They should, not, they should not come out of an encounter with you and know more about what they did wrong than what they should do right. Amen. So, so questions should be like, okay, so how could I have done it so that it would have affected you in a better way? Now, see what you did? You always messing up. I don't know why you would do that in the first place. And if you start asking why they did it, that is torture for you and them. Especially if you got a little kid, because what you're telling them is, make up a lie. What if they say, I did it because you taught me to do it that way? Then you're going to hit them. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it, the art of being able to see the moment and make good decisions comes from thinking, and it has to be done in an under-elevated tension level. Yes. Like, you can't grab the game. Now, look at these. Now, which one? Which one? Which one do you want to pick? Which one do you want to pick? They're just going to start guessing. Uh, that, whatever makes this go away. <laughs> and they won't know how to make good decisions. All right? Your free will is a gift that God has given you that can never be taken away. And if you do not use that well, you cannot reflect biblical truth. Here's the second thing. We teach our kids that their desires should drive their choices. And we've talked about this before. I talked about it a little earlier. This is what I said I was going to come back and be revisit. What should a kid use to determine what they should eat? What should a kid use to determine what clothes they should wear? What should a kid determine, uh, use to determine when they should go to bed? Or what shoes they should have? Let me rephrase that question. What, sh what should you use to determine what you should eat? What clothes you should wear? What time you should go to bed? 
what shoes you should wear. All those different kinds of things. There should be a principle to live by that reflects what that looks like. So that not so that your kid will have a bedtime based on what's on the wall, so that your kid can make a decision about their health when they get older. The reason why we have unhealthy kids, the reason why juvenile diabetes is constantly on the rise is because we taught our kids, you don't have to eat that if you don't like it. They're like, oh, I only have to eat what I like. When they go in quick trip, you think they look, you know, and here's the deal, junk food takes up more space in more stores than good food. And now that the organic stuff is coming back and all that stuff is coming back on the back end, people my age are starting to try to figure out how to eat good, but we've taught our kids bad. Now the reason why is because we got off the path, went into the woods, and we saw the cougar, and now we've, we're going back to the path and learn how to act right because we know that the mountain lions are out there. Amen. They ain't been to the doctor yet. They're not going through what we have to go through. They're not being probed the way we've been probed. So they feel like they're young. It's the same thing with all the other things that we've been taking. You know, and I, and I say this, uh, you know, making decisions about ourselves and our own health is important because here's what the Bible says. Let's suppose you teach them to follow their desire. Here's what their desire will lead to. Tell me whether this might be a little factual. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 19 says this. The acts of the flesh are obvious. These are, this is what it will lead to if I am making decisions based on what I want. And this is simply by what time I get to choose when I feel like taking a bath. I get to choose what food I like and I want to eat. I get to choose when, when my desire is how I am being driven to make decisions. It says... I use this platform to determine my decisions when I get older. Sexual immorality, impurity, and uh, debauchery. It goes on and says idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, uh, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, uh, and, and e uh, excuse me, and uh, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. All that kind of stuff. Then he says, and if you live in that way, you can't be reflective of the kingdom of God. So what we're doing is teaching them to use their free will choices to ban themselves from experiencing the kingdom of God. And so then when they get to be a certain age, they say, well, the church ain't no good for me. These people ain't no good. This stuff ain't no good for me. Why? Because you haven't been able to experience it. Because you haven't, you've used your free will to get off the path. Like, I wonder what, and some of my white friends who go hiking all the time, What's the thrill of a hike? I mean, I've never, I've never, you know, I was in Scouts and we went hiking and all this kind of stuff. But I've never just said, let's go into some wild wildernesses where nobody actually lives, where, where the animals run free and roam around in their space. I've never had that desire. Of course, I never grew up and was taught. All those different kinds of things either. I was taught to make decisions to be safe. Why? Because I grew up in the hood. You're walking down the street, you're making decisions to be safe. The animals that are out there, even the human animals, you got to be careful. You definitely don't go down a block that you don't supposed to be going down. So I'm definitely not going to go up and go through woods. So I've been, made, I've been programmed to make decisions a certain way. So we had a, we had a retreat. And uh, uh, some years back, the elders, we were out, and we was out in place, and it was woody, it was out there, it was dark, and some of the elders was like, hey, let's, let's go on a, uh, let's go out and let's go walk out there. By the why? I'm like, I ain't going out there. I ain't going out there. I don't go where ain't no street lights. And, they, and, and, and this is a white guy, he was like, well, why? I said, look, if I have to explain to you, you wouldn't even understand. So, so just... You know, they went out there with the lake and all this kind of stuff. I ain't doing that. All the animals coming down, they drink from that lake. So, you know what I'm saying? They were raised to see things one way, to make decisions based on a set of things. I was raised to make decisions based on another set of things. I think mine were healthier. They thought theirs were healthier. What are your kids being raised to, to use to make decisions on how to manage their free will choice? Here's another thing that it says, Ephesians chapter 2, verse number uh, uh, 3 uh, says this. It says, all of you also lived amongst them uh, uh, at one time, 
gratifying the cravings of your of our flesh and following the desires of the uh, uh, and thoughts, following his desires and thoughts. And then he says, and like the rest, we were by nature facing consequences of wrath, deserving of wrath. We are our, we chose consequences that were bad. We got off the path and then got mad at the bear. I don't know why the bear followed me around. Because you're in his space. That's why. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we get off the path. He says, you got off the path because you were using your passions and desires to make decisions. That was your principle to live by. If we train our kids that way, they will do that. They will not come to church. Hey, man, when, we got a, when we were growing up, and I'm not saying everybody needs to do this. You got to live your own way. When we were growing up, it wasn't like, I don't feel like going to church no more. I hear your parents like, well, he don't really want to go to church. Number seven is the right answer. <laughs> I don't care how many choices he gets. Number seven is the right answer. They say, well, I'm going to let him make his own decision about what God. No, number seven is the right answer. Just because there's a lot of other answers doesn't mean that number seven has changed. God said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves. You, you know, I understand we're in a pandemic. But as we go back, some people say, look, you know what? I now got a new choice. I can just stay home and watch church. Yes, but number seven is still the answer. Amen. 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 He says this in Galatians 6, verse number 8. Whoever sows to please the flesh. I don't like that kind of food. I don't like going over there. I don't like this person. I don't like doing this. Whoever sows to please the flesh will, from the flesh, will reap what? Destruction. He says, whosoever... Uh, whosoever sows or whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. So how I use my free will will determine my experience. All men are not bad. All women are not crazy. Your decision. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying none of I'm not saying none of them make, but I'm saying all of them make. <laughs> the other thing is we are overwhelmed with choices. And we have the illusion that we get to determine what's best or what's right. Just because Adam and Eve had a whole lot more choices, seven didn't change. Unfortunately, we have a lot of choices now. It's crazy. When we had five choices. On what channel we watch on TV? Most of us watch decent TV. Even when it moved to 30 choices and you had that cable that you spin back and forth. We made worse decisions, but it still wasn't all that bad. Now you got 700 decisions, 700 choices. And we have an epidemic of people addicted to pornography, addicted to gambling, who are addicted to gamery, who are addicted to all those different kinds of things because we got a lot of other choices. Right. Now we got a generation raised up where they don't even have to have a TV. Matter of fact, most of them prefer to live their life with a cell phone. Right. So we've added another choice. And I'll tell you, that choice does not mean that seven is not still the answer. All right, y'all praying with me? Yes. So, what is our biblical responsibility regarding freedom of choice? What does God expect for us? Here's the first thing. Don't lean to your own understanding. Very simple scripture that we've known for a long time. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding in all of your ways. Submit to him and he will keep you on the path away from the crazy animals. And, and here's the deal. Um, if seven is the only answer, how many choices do I want? That's what I'm saying. How many do I want? How many news channels do you need to watch? You know, some people are you know, watching news all day. 
You know, how many do I need to watch? How many of other people's lives? You know, the soap operas used to drive us crazy. You know why? Because it felt like you were in people's business too much. Like, why y'all watching just that, how they live their daily life? Who they cheating on and whose money they stealing and all this kind of stuff? I mean, why y'all watching all that kind of stuff when we could be playing sports outside? Right. Now it's gotten worse. Now it's just not only the soap operas that come on, but it's reality TV. And it's the Jerry Springer type stuff that's out there. And they talk shows, I be seeing a new person with a talk show every week. I'm, you know, my thing is, is why are we having all these choices? If you want to know how to live, the Bible has a captive uh, 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 pattern on number seven. Got the right answer. Here's another one. Find your delight in the Lord's, in, in, in uh, Christ's Lordship. Here's the deal. It says, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord and do good. If you trust him, it'll lead to doing good. It says, dwell in the land uh, and enjoy safe pasture. It says, delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Like the, if you don't like this food, it is probably because the desires of your heart are wrong. Now, let me tell you something. Have you ever seen, you ever paid attention to the rise of kale? Yeah, kale, like nobody heard of kale 10 years ago. Kale was used to dress the produce aisle once upon a time, and it was something you didn't eat. Now, the reason why you didn't eat kale is, I don't know if you did, well, I used to do when I was little, I used to try stuff. I ate some kale. It was horrible when I was a kid. And I was told by the produce guy, you're not supposed to eat that. I understood why, because it's nasty. Now, guess what? Kale's still nasty. <laughs> kale didn't improve. But the rise of kale has been because we discovered that it was something in kale that was good for us. So it is not our desire for the taste of kale that drives that. In fact, it is our recognition of its value. Now, here's what's happened. We have ate it so long that after a while, we start saying kale is good. People walking in talking about, man, I want me a kale salad. I said, you want the world who like them? I go get me some pickled beets, and it'd be a snack for me. I sit there and just, and, they, and my family look at me like, hey, hey. Yeah, they, they just don't understand. When I was little, I didn't. I don't know what changed one or the other. I know it's a superfood that's good for you and all this kind of stuff, but maybe at some point or another, the, the recognition of its value caused my desire to change. And what I'm saying is, maybe living biblical is not kicking it at 6902 or whatever they call it these days, every weekend. However, if you live biblically, that food that you don't desire now, because you know it's good for you, will start to change how you see it. And you will look at people, because I know. Man, my wife used to go to Kathleen's. Some of you are old enough to know Kathleen's. But to think now to go to a club like that, we're like, I don't know. We'd be, like, we'd be talking like we never did it. I don't know why they want to go. Why would they want to go out there and do all, you know, all that stuff? Because you saw value change and it starts changing you. So if you teach your kids that value is in what they feel, what they desire, and what's good for them, they'll grow up thinking that. That's right. Next thing is, is find your purpose in seeking God's kingdom agenda. He says, seek you first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and his righteousness and all other things will, will, uh, will be given to you. So what God is saying is, if you're seeking God, all that other stuff would make sense. Let me tell you something. If you have a constitution, if you're a single person and you have a family constitution, you have a constitution for yourself that guides you, and you meet another person, and you say, here's the constitution by which I am not going to deviate. They look at your constitution, and if y'all that far off, 
then you will know that's your premarital counseling right there. You be like, right, okay, right now we, it ain't gonna work. But if you go based on your desire, but he killed, but she bad, she thick, all this stuff that young people say. Then all of a sudden, later on, you be trying to figure out how to get out of this mess. If you marry. And you coach your children based on these primary principles of your constitution, then your children will not stray far from it. Here's what the Bible says. He says, when you put together these words of mine, he says, hang them on the doorpost, hang them on the, and uh, drown your kids with them. Most of all, they ought to see you living by them. If you don't have a constitution, you're that team that huddles and just no plan, and just run all over the place. Here's your homework. First stage of homework, reduce the flow of information by eliminating all the sources that are not biblical or have a biblical purpose. I'm just asking you to do this for one week. For one week. That means if you spend a lot of time on social media, if you spend a lot of time doing all that kind of stuff, if you spend your time in the news 24 hours a day, if you do all that kind of stuff, what I'm asking you to do is to give it up for a week unless it's a biblical source or have a biblical purpose. Like some things like if you, if you, uh, if you watch a video exercising. If you do uh, sometimes the food channels, I mean, if you do those kind of things that are beneficial to you in that way, then that is, there's a biblical purpose for you to be biblically healthy, for you to be all those different kinds of things. But uh, if you're just watching, you know, Housewives from Atlanta, that entertainment is information that I want you to give up for a week. If you glued to the news, Fox or CNN, whatever your preference is, MSNBC, if you glued all then I want you to shift that for the week so you don't have so, so that, because number seven is still right. I just don't want you to have all those other information, all that other information coming to you as if there's a different choice. So here's the deal. We think that the more choices we have, the better off we are with the illusion that we can make a decision better than seven. More choices doesn't mean that seven's going to change because you thought something different. Here's the second thing. Complete a written draft of your family or individual principles to live by and share it with one other person outside your family. Here's the deal. If you don't share it with nobody, you're probably not doing it. By now, you should have three of your constitutional principles written in draft form. Amen. But if you haven't shared it with nobody, then I, I almost guarantee you haven't done it. So I'm asking you to share it with one person. The last thing is I want you to commit fully to one to three reliable biblical sources that drive your choices for the week. What biblical sources am I going to use? Now, I know you have a lot of unbiblical sources because you use social media, you all those different kinds of things. I'm saying find you one to three reliable biblical sources that you will use. Some of it might be Bible study, you know, because I know a lot of folks haven't been to Bible study since been in person. Uh, you know, some of it might be, uh, you might have a, uh, let's say, I listen to Urban Alternative, watch Tony Evans, or, or some, some place where you are getting fed enough to be able to make biblical decisions. You can go to our YouTube, Transform Your Life, and pick up this whole series that we've been talking about this. But some homework, I, I want you to put it into action this week. Because if you have no plan, then, you know, it's just talk. It's just talk. Joshua, when they got to the, to the other place in the land, he says, listen, y'all, I don't know what y'all going to do, but y'all didn't say y'all love the Lord. We was back at the mountain, y'all said y'all love the Lord. And then we was over here, y'all said y'all love the Lord. But if you ain't going to put it into practice, then we ain't going to do anything. So he says, uh, not only did he tell him, he says, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. But he says, I'm going to write a constitution of how we're going to live, and I'm going to put it everywhere. So that if you ever come over my house, you know what the rules are. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, or if you're online and you want to connect with us, cfbckc.org is where all of our 
uh, uh, connections are made. Uh, uh, at this particular point, we're adding to the website as it goes so that we can provide avenues for membership and all the other kinds of things that we're putting in place. Uh, Five score years ago. Five score years ago.